a lot of people have been asking to see a tour of our Nordhaven 40. As we started compiling footage, it started to get really long, but we decided to keep it all in there for those who are interested in the details. During the tour, we will go through the boat section by section. The episode notes include the timestamp for each section in case you want to skip forward to somewhere in the boat that's more interesting to you. Now let's get started in the cockpit. This is our back deck or cockpit. It's the first area that you come to when you come on board the boat. Not a whole lot of space. The uh, upside of having less space in the cockpit is it allows us to have more interior volume inside the boat. And always on boats there's trade-offs and this is one of them. So having a smaller cockpit gives us more room in the main saloon and living space. The other thing that a small cockpit does is that it allows water to ship off of the boat easier. Less water would actually come on board if we were in a following sea and waves were coming over the back. Uh, the volume of water would be less than if this area was bigger and it would ship it would ship out through the scuppers down here on the bottom. Not a whole lot to show. We've got a barbecue right here underneath this cover. This table is a filet table and we use it for a food prep table as well. Back over here is a molded in seating area. We've got the molded in seats on each side of the cockpit and they double as storage. So on this side we've got propane tanks for the uh, barbecue and for the galley inside. There's two five gallon propane tanks. And like I said, it's a nice little seating area. So if you're in Anchorage or underway, you can sit back here and kind of relax and chill. This is a life sling, which is a man overboard device. If we had somebody go in the water, it's something that you can throw and use to help recover them. Hopefully you don't ever have to use it. Underneath this panel right here is a hot and cold water shower. So if you go in the water to go swimming or diving or something, you can, uh, you can rinse off with this before you go inside the boat so you don't get salt water inside the boat. These louvers are intake air, combustion air for the, combustion and cooling air for the main engine. And there's one on each side. And then we've got a freshwater wash down, down here. Fishing rod racks, uh, fishing rod storage and hanger storage up here. Right here, this is a, uh, it's a flat line rope that we can use for either tying off to trees if we need to anchor in a, in a tight area up in the Northwest or probably what we use it for more often is a, is a line for the, for the stern anchor. And it's a flat webbing instead of a traditional rope, so it stores in this nice little reel. Side of the cockpit, I've got a remote panel for a dive compressor. This allows us to fill scuba tanks on our boat without having to go to a dive shop. Uh, it's nice for recreational diving, but more importantly for if we ever have any problems with the boat where we need to go underneath the boat to either service zinks or check running gear if we were to run over a fishing net out in the ocean or something and we had to go underneath the boat to to clear it we have plenty of air on board we've got storage for four scuba tanks two whips right here so that we can fill the tanks we've got uh, more fishing rod holders on this side and again the uh, intake air for the main engine on the starboard side we've got a boarding door so you open this gate and then this door here opens to give you access either to your tender, uh, there's a ladder that goes down there if you want to go diving, or to get off and on at a dock. Same storage is on the port side, over here on the starboard side. On this side we've got fishing tackle stored in here. And then there's one more door, like that boarding door on the transom right here. And this gives you access to the swim step, um, either to go in the water again or to get on and off of a, of a dinghy. The center of the cockpit deck right here, there's a large hatch. This is the access to the lazarette, which is a big storage area that goes the full beam of the boat. It gives us access to the rudder post, the autopilot um, rudder angle indicators, water makers down there, our inverters down there. So there's a lot of equipment down there. And then what we mostly have in there right now, because we're living on the boat and cruising full time, is just a whole lot of storage. So we've got a whole bunch of boxes down there. And this hatch opens up. And we've just got a bunch of boxes and a bunch of stuff stored in here. Plate right here unscrews and this is access to the top of the rudder post. And theoretically you could attach a, an emergency tiller to this rudder post to allow you to steer the boat with a tiller back here. How well that would actually work I have no idea. We've never tried it and I hope that we never have to use it. But if the steering was ever to completely fail we would at least be able to turn the rudder with this backup hatch. One of the things that was really again really well thought out on this boat they made plans for all kinds of contingencies. This is the door to the main cabin and saloon. 
It's a fully ruggedized door with a watertight seal, the gasket, all the way around the perimeter. And it has two dogs to completely dog the door down against that seal. To open this door, what you do is take these dogs and rotate them 90 degrees. We don't always keep the dogs uh, tightened down, but if we are running offshore, we typically will keep them dogged down. And then once those dogs are open, there's just a latch like a traditional house door. And then this opens and it latches in place over here. And this is the door to the saloon. When you come into the saloon on our boat, this is the door that you enter through. Um, again, you'll see these positive dogs to latch the door down against this gasket that's in here. And that prevents any water that would board the boat with a following sea from coming into the cabin here. This is one of the features that you'll see on any of the passage maker Nordhavens is that they all have very positive seals. The windows are all kind of built the same way and when we're underway on uh, offshore passages, these four windows in the saloon right here have 3 8 inch acrylic panels that we put over them to uh, also prevent them from getting broken out by any kind of water that would come over if we were, if we were rolling in a, in a beam sea. This seating area over here is very similar to what we've got over here, except that there's no table. Got this little ottoman right here. Now this thing kind of doubles as a little cocktail table or a table for eating snacks. If we're sitting here watching TV. Storage again underneath all of these seating areas. The cushions pull up. And there's storage underneath these panels. Under this one we've got a whole bunch of tools and power tools stored. We've got a hatch to the engine room on the floor right here. Uh, rarely use that. That's more designed for um, if we needed to do any kind of heavy machinery equipment replacement. There's a big panel here that would pull in and out. But we usually en enter the engine room through a door down in Cassidy's room. So one of the things they did on the Nordhaven 40 versus some of the other boats that they make is to maximize space inside the saloon. It's a full beam saloon, so there's no walk around on the starboard side, like on a lot of the boats. The disadvantage of that is anytime you need to bring anything from the boat deck or the fore deck, you have to actually walk through the living space. And so you have to make sure that you're not carrying anything that's dirty or could be leaking or anything like that. The advantage of the full beam saloon is that you maximize your living space. The saloon on the 40 is actually very large. It's not... Um, any smaller than the 43, which is a bigger boat, and it actually may be a little larger because of the fact that it goes to the full extent of the beam of both sides of the boat versus stopping on the starboard side for a walk around. Very comfortable living space for three people. It's, uh, it does get a little crowded in here because the table doesn't move out of the way. So when you get a lot of people on board, it gets to be kind of crowded. But for three of us living on board full time, this space is actually very comfortable. We can sit over here in this kind of couch space. Three of us together can sit here. Um, you can kind of put your feet up, relax. Our TV is on that wall over there so you can sit and watch movies. We eat our meals over here on this table. Cassidy does homeschool here, so it's not only the place where we eat, it also doubles as the classroom. Another thing I'll mention too is when uh, when we're underway on long offshore passages and if we're going into a head sea especially, the forward cabin is almost unlivable because of hull slap and noise from the water and just the fact that that's where the boat pitches the most. And this is actually the most steady place on the boat when we're going into a head sea because of the fact that it's aft in the boat and the, the pitch axis of the boat is probably you know somewhere forward of this area. So when Jen and I are rotating on night shift watches, we'll typically sleep right here. And it's a pretty nice place to sleep. Uh, you know, we'll put our heads down this way and you kind of brace your arm like that. Over in this corner of the saloon, we've got our TV. TV is under an articulating mount so that we can pull it out and sit over on that side in the couch area and watch TV. Or you can also sit right here on the side where we eat dinner if you want to watch it there. So that's kind of a versatile place to store the TV. Another uh, HVAC control for our reverse cycle heating and air conditioning. And then on the wall over there is a control for the S-Bar diesel heater. Right here is our freezer. This freezer is different than a, a traditional freezer in that it's, it's sliding drawers instead of a swing door. And what that allows us to do is if anything shifts in a seaway when we're out and the boat's rolling back and forth, 
if the food shifts when we go to open the door, it's not going to spill all over the floor. So that's kind of a nice feature. And then just a stereo system on this bulkhead right here. These stairs right here give you access up to the pilot house where we run the boat and to the doors that get you out onto the Portuguese bridge and the boat deck and the foredeck. Inside this post right here is our dry stack exhaust. The main engine doesn't have any seawater in it. It's keel cooled, so it doesn't exhaust out the back of a boat with seawater like a traditional wet exhaust boat. To get the exhaust from the engine up to where it exits, about 30 feet above the water line, they've got to run it through the cabin. And so inside this post right here is a big exhaust tube and then a bunch of, in a bunch of insulation. And then it's hidden behind this wood that's attached to the galley counter right here. So this is our galley, our kitchen on the boat, you call it a galley. Uh, it's on the same level as the saloon, basically separated from the saloon by this piece of cabinetry right here. This has our sink, um, like you'll see everywhere else on this boat, they've really maximized space. So we've got a little trap door in the countertop right here that we use for storing larger appliances like a pressure cooker and some water bowls and things like that. Two basin sink, a uh, normal kind of household faucet that makes it really easy to do dishes. We don't have a dishwasher on a boat this size. Some larger boats will have a dishwasher. This one unfortunately doesn't, but it's easy enough to do dishes by hand for three people. So over here, we've got a three burner stove and oven. Uh, very similar to what you'd see in a house, except that it's 24 inches wide instead of 36. It runs on propane. There's a range hood over here to exhaust gas from cooking. These windows or port lights both open so that we can get cross ventilation in here while we're cooking, which is pretty nice. We've got a coffee machine and a soda stream thing here. On this wall over here, you got a microwave, uh, more storage, and a trash compactor and the refrigerator. The trash compactor is actually really nice to have when we are out cruising for long periods of time because we can go 10 days or two weeks without having to change a trash bag. And we don't have a lot of space to store trash on the boat, so that's it, kind of a nice feature to have. When we first got the boat, I thought it was kind of a luxury, but it's actually uh, really, really useful on a, on a relatively small boat like this that we're living on full time. The refrigerator is very similar to the freezer over there in that it's a drawer type system that pulls out so that we can access our food from the top and when food shifts underway it doesn't fall out when you open it. And then just more storage all over the place. So all of these hatches open up just store food in here and the entire galley has storage like this. So we've got food and stuff crammed into every nook and cranny on the boat. On the side of the galley counter right here is a panel with a couple of sight gauges in it and what these allow us to do is monitor the level of the fresh water tanks. There's three fresh water tanks on board for a total of 250 gallons and when the water level gets to the bottom of these sight gauges that means we've got 60 gallons left. So we try to keep the water level in the upper half of the top tanks and that allows us to uh, troubleshoot the water maker. If we ever have any problems with the water maker we'll always know that we have a lot of water to live off of while we troubleshoot that and make repairs. Alright, so if you follow me down these stairs, I'll show you the living quarters. Port side is Cassidy's room. There's a bunk bed in there. Starboard side is the head. At the end of the hall, you'll find the owner's stateroom. It's really just a fancy name for our bedroom. So in our bedroom we have a bed as you would expect and we have a ton of storage. There's a half size clothing locker here, the other side I actually have a full length locker. Tons of storage up here and Dougal's idea was to buy these bins so that we can maximize the space. So each bin pulls out, uh, he's actually even more organized than I am so on his side he has them all labeled. See, mine's a little messy. I keep my books here. On this side, as I mentioned, there's a full length closet, clothing locker. Dougal's side has the same storage that, they, that we have on the other side. More storage in here at the head of the beds. And this locker is where the anchor chain is stored. 
Cassidy comes in pretty handy when we have trouble with the anchor. You can slide her down into the anchor locker and she can do some repairs for us. Some more storage here. It serves as a nightstand or a small dresser drawer. This unit right here, this controls the temperature. We have an S-bar diesel heater and this is how we control the temperature in our room, the bathroom, and Cassidy's room. And over here, Dougal has installed a Maritron display. It'll tell us if we are dragging anchor, it tells us speed. You can monitor several things, several systems on the boat from here in the bedroom. Under the bed, it lifts up. It's easy enough for me to lift up. We store some exercise equipment up here on top. And then in the back, we store things that we don't use as often. We have sleeping bags for guests, extra blankets for the cold. Um, and under that, we actually have our storm shutters that we put on if we're going out on a long passage. Down here we have the emergency shutoff for the bow thrusters. Hi, this is my room. I have, I have a bunk bed. Two beds. This is where my friends sleep. And also where my little bear sleeps. Um, when my friends come over, I can pull this uh, open somehow. Well, at least I don't know how. And then you put this rope around. And then it's strong enough to at least hold me to get up to my bed. I have a little corner where most of my stuffed animals are. And then I have this corner with my favorite stuffed animals. I came up with my jungle theme because, well, this bed spread used to be like that one. Just blue. And then, then my mom found this bed spread. I decided it should be jungle theme. So my mom got me monkey stickers, monkey stickers, monkey sticker, monkey stickers. And this is my bookshelf. I have an animal book and a bunch of library books and a penny pocket book. This is the washer and dryer. It doubles together. It's all in one. Pretty cool, huh? Well, there is laundry in it now. There's not much to explain about that. This is my closet. So this is the pilot house. This is where we run the boat from. It's got all of our engine controls and electronics and it's isolated from the rest of the boat with the idea being that because we use this boat on offshore passages overnight, you don't want any distractions from other things that might be going on in the boat or other lights, the TVs on downstairs, any of that sort of thing. Um, this pilot house is smaller than on a lot of the other Nordhaven, so we don't have room for a full size helm chair. So instead of a helm chair, we've installed what's called a leaning post, which is right here. 
it's kind of a stool that you can sit on top of and you can lean against it. Uh, I can sit up here if I'm running the boat and when we're in waters where there's a lot of logs and rocks and other boats that we might need to be aware of, it's good to be sitting here at the controls so that you can take action if you need to avoid somebody. And if there's any kind of seaway or heavy waves or anything like that, you can kind of sit back here, you can lean against this thing. We've also got a handle up here that you can hold on to. One of the things that you might notice that most boats have and we don't have in this boat is a steering wheel. So there used to be a large ship's wheel right here. Decided to take it out because it was about nine turns lock to lock. So it was incredibly difficult to spin the thing and still look out of the window in the front here when you are parking the boat. So instead of the steering wheel, what I've done instead is install what's called a follow-up lever. It's this lever right here, and it's dead simple. All you do is, if you want the rudder to turn one direction, you move it that direction, and the rudder follows. You want the rudder centered, you move this back, and the rudder's centered. So you always know where your rudder is, you always know what direction you're going to turn. There is no issues. We do still have the steering wheel. It's down mounted inside the engine room. If anything ever happened and we had a failure of any of these systems and we needed to grab the steering wheel, we would be able to install it in a matter of 30 seconds or so. But it's a lot easier to steer and, and handle the boat without having the steering wheel. If we're on an offshore passage where there's not a whole lot of things to watch or deal with, um, it's more comfortable to sit back in this kind of uh, bench seat over here. And it's got a table where we can fit three people Cassidy's sitting over here, kind of looking out the window right now. The three of us can sit here, eat dinner, look out the window periodically. It's also a nice place just to sit and eat dinner when we're in a, in a scenic anchorage, um, like we are right now in southeast Alaska. Uh, sometimes if you're sitting on watch and you want to read a book or something like that, you can sit back like this, pick up a book and read. And the other thing that we've got is up here, this is called watch birth. So the watch berth is nice to have because it gives us a space where somebody can sleep close to the person that's on watch and then you can have two people available if there's any kind of emergency or something like that. And it also gives us another space for guests. This can kind of be a room where guests can sleep. There's not a lot of privacy, but it's a pretty comfortable bed. Reality is when there's when there's uh, three of us on board, it kind of gets used for storage. So we've got a whole lot of life jackets and other stuff up there. Um, these doors are Dutch style doors, so they've got dogs to keep them closed. If there was anything that we needed to see outside, you can open these up pretty easily. It gives you a little bit better sight lines. We've got a whole lot of electronics up here in the pilot house. It seems like marine electronics are always becoming obsolete. But right now we've got a couple of uh, Furuno devices that are kind of state of the art, at least until they come out with something new. We've got two primary screens right here. So all of our electronics are kind of built around these two Furuno displays. They're both TZ Touch 15s, uh, relatively new. They're a couple of years old, but they're the, the latest devices from Furuno. And everything is uh, all integrated. So we've got a radar, we've got a chart on this display. You can change these displays to show um, all kinds of different data. So you can scroll through the screens right here. We could change this one to show two radars simultaneously um, and that's kind of nice sometimes you might have one that's set out at 12 nautical miles and this one I can turn this on and we can have this one zoomed in extremely close so if you're looking to avoid somebody that was in like kayakers or people that were in really close and then you can have a big picture on the left side moving over to this display right now we've got a whole lot of gauges that are coming off of our NMEA 2000 network a whole lot of other sensors on the boat so this is kind of a place where you can look for a whole lot of data at once. So we've got wind speed, speed through water, speed over ground, some autopilot controls, fuel burn information, and it's just kind of a nice place to see a whole lot of data at once when you're watching, when you're running the boat. Um, one of the things that we can put on this screen is a 3D fish finder, a 3D sonar. And this is kind of useful when we're navigating through tight passages where there's rocks and other things like that that we're interested in if we're looking to make sure that the contours on the chart actually match what we're seeing underwater they can shift into this mode and this shows you what the bottom of the uh, seafloor looks like so right now we're in 400 feet of water and you can see there's a little bit of contour to the bottom but there's not a whole lot going on we're probably over a kind of a sandy muddy bottom right now but this is kind of a useful feature to 
to run in this mode when we are in kind of narrow passages and shallower water. Also when anchoring or if we're looking for fish, fish will show up in the water column right here. This is the boat and this is kind of the water column right here. This monitor right here, we're running a software program called Time Zero and it, we use this as our primary chart plotter when we are navigating and we also use it for route planning. We typically have it set up in this mode where we've got a north up view on the left side of the screen. This kind of gives us a big picture and then on the right side we have heading up and on the right side right now we've also got a radar overlay going. The radar overlay is interesting sometimes because it'll kind of verify that buoys are buoys and and uh, not boats and you can see that it's overlapping the radar image on these rocks over here right now. So sometimes we'll run with the radar overlay on, sometimes it's just too cluttered and it makes the screen too noisy, but right now it's kind of a good way to run. You can change this into a lot of different modes. You can have it in just a pure navigation mode where you have a single screen and you can change that from north up to heading up. There's a planning mode where you have a whole lot of other data such as information about waypoints and things like that. I just got a heading sensor alarm. We've been having a problem with our heading sensor so it's alarming periodically. In this mode you can see um, more granular information about various waypoints as far as latitude, longitude and things like that. Uh, you can run it in a pure radar mode uh, right now. Um, you can see one of the boats that we're traveling with is just off of our port quarter right here. And we can see them on AIS, which is this little triangle, as well as radar. You can run it in uh, navigation and radar mode, where you have radar on one screen and a chart on the other side. And back to the dual nav mode, where we normally run. It also has some kind of more gimmicky features, like you can put this into a 3D perspective. Uh, we don't really ever use that, but it's there as an option if you did want to use it. So the autopilot can be run in a couple of different modes. Right now we're running in just a heading mode where we, we program in a heading and the boat will steer to that heading. So right now we've got 280 degrees programmed in. If we want to make incremental course changes, you can turn this little knob right here. So I can turn it to port and it'll go 279, 278. If I needed to make larger rapid course changes, if there was a big turn that we wanted to make or if there was a log or something else that we needed to dodge, you can push these buttons right here and that will make 10 degree course changes. It also can run in nav mode where if we have a pre-planned route, you can push the nav button and it will actually navigate along that route and it'll even make turns when you get to waypoints. It gives you a warning that it's going to make the turn but the, court, the autopilot computer will actually just make the, the turn for you and drive along that course. So our primary autopilot, we've also got a backup autopilot this is an older unit, but it still works pretty well. And if we had a failure of the primary autopilot, we can just throw one switch and it'll turn this autopilot computer on. And then we can steer the boat with, with this autopilot computer. Steering this boat by hand is, uh, is not easy, especially when you're offshore and there's not a lot of landmarks. So we rely on the autopilots heavily. And having a redundant autopilot is kind of a key feature for long offshore passages. So our primary engine controls are this little box right here. This is the transmission. This is the throttle control. There's not really a lot going on there. Um, these are the controls for our bow and stern thrusters, which we use in close quarters maneuvering and parking the boat. They're fairly simple controls. This is just a lever. Uh, they're not energized right now, so I can show you what they do. If I want to have the bow go to port, you just put the lever over that way. To starboard, you put the lever over that way. Same thing with the stern, and the boat will actually pivot in its own axis if you turn the bow one direction and the stern the other direction. So you would just kind of twist the levers like that, and that will allow you to rotate the boat. Other controls that we've got on this side right here are the wiper controls, or just rudimentary on-off switches. It's kind of a pain to control sometimes when it's raining heavily because you have to park them and then turn them back on. Uh, this is the horn, not much to say about the horn. Windless control for the anchor winch in the front. Um, this allows us to actually lower and retrieve the anchor from within the pilot house. It's nice if it's raining out or if it's windy or something like that and we don't want to send somebody up on deck. There are controls for the windless up on the deck as well, but this is a nice place to control it from. 
This lever right here is for the spotlight that we've got up on the roof of the pilot house. It's a really bright spotlight. It's useful to have, but we rarely use it because it will just absolutely ruin your night vision if it reflects off of the white fiberglass on the bow or anywhere else on the boat. But it is nice to have if we're looking out for small boats that might show up on the radar or crab pots, especially when you're running offshore at night and there's an area where there might be a lot of crab pots or other things like that that you need to avoid. Um, it gives us a lot of range. You can spin the, the spurt, uh, spotlight almost 360 degrees and you can pivot it left and right and up and down. Over on this panel right here, we've got two VHF radios. Uh, that's for redundancy, and we can monitor two channels at once without scanning. So right now I've got one of them in channel 16, which is the Coast Guard station, and then one on another uh, channel that we're using to communicate with some of the people that we're traveling with right now. I could put both of those in a scanning mode where they're scanning through other channels. This right here is a loud hailer that allows us to either talk through the mic microphone through a speaker that's up on the roof of the pilot house or it also has a whole bunch of kind of canned signals one of them is a fog horn that we use we've been using it a lot when we're up here in Alaska and there's dense fog in the morning and that will broadcast a fog signal periodically so that other boats know that we're around if they don't see us on radar or if we're not showing up on their AIS and then finally over here on the right this is an old Furuno chart plotter device what we primarily use it for is radar. It has an old open array radar that's up on the roof of the pilot house. It's more powerful than our solid state radar, although the screen is lower resolution. But it is nice just to have a redundant radar and it allows us to kind of uh, see things farther off than our solid state radar does. And if we had a failure of any of the other electronics, this has a built-in GPS antenna and things like that too, but we primarily run it just in this radar mode. So on the upper panel here, we've got a lot of kind of secondary displays. Uh, starting on the left, this is a standalone depth sounder. It is not showing any data right now because the transducer is on the fridge and it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. It's on the list of things that we need to replace, but it's kind of low priority since it's a redundant device. So uh, for now, we're just kind of leaving it alone. Moving over to the right, this is a display that we can pull a whole lot of information from the NMEA 2000 bus. Right now it is showing fuel used, fuel burn rate, and roll and pitch. Right now we're in completely protected waters and there's no wind so there is not much roll or pitch to speak of. You might see one or two degrees either way. When we're out in a seaway offshore the roll and pitch becomes more interesting but it's it's uh, just kind of something that's interesting to look at. It doesn't, there's not really much we can do about it. It will tell us how well our stabilizers are working, maybe. Moving over to the next device. This is a Maritron device that we've recently installed. And it also allows us to pull all kinds of data from the enemy A2000 bus and from anything else that's networked on our system. Right now, I've got it set up to show apparent wind and true wind on this display, but you can cycle through a whole lot of other things. Uh, this is kind of the GPS satellite constellation. This is some bilge alarms. We have alarms programmed to go off if there's high water in the bilge. And we have another one of these things in the forward stateroom, so it will wake us up at night if there was any kind of problems with, uh, with high water in the bilge. It's one of those things that you hope you never need to have, but it would, it would wake us up and it would alarm us if, if we needed to uh, take action as far as high water. Um, here's some more fuel consumption displays. This can be customized to show fuel burn from the generator from the main engine, nautical miles per gallon as well as gallons per hour. Uh, this back one right here, this is temperature. We put our temperature probe on the stuffing box which is the, the shaft gland for our main engine. If that starts to get outside of a, a prescribed range that would kind of let us know that there's too much friction in the system and it's something to be aware of. And so we can customize this thing too to alarm when it's either a certain amount of degrees above sea temperature or just at a um, absolute number like 100 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that and this is engine room temperature which is also something that we need to be aware of if it gets too hot uh, it usually is a signal that there's something going on in the engine room that we need to be aware of um, it's got a, an electronic barometer that'll show trends over 24 hours so that's kind of interesting to have as far as weather forecasting right now you can see there's been kind of a slow drop over the past uh, 24 hours. Right here is an analog rudder indicator, rudder angle indicator. 
it's nice to know where the rudder is when you're steering in close quarters and parking the boat. We also have this same information um, electronically on the NMEA 2000 bus, but it's kind of nice to have redundant information like this. One more over, this is a AIS display. Uh, the AIS is a transponder that will broadcast to other boats our position, speed, other data about our boat, and it also allows us to see where other boats are. Over here on the far right side of the panel is our analog engine gauges. So this is our tachometer, shows engine RPM. This is our coolant temperature. The coolant typically runs about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. If it gets hotter than that, it's usually an indication that there's something wrong that we need to check. Oil pressure, the voltage from one of the alternators on the engine, and engine hours. And then this panel here is the key switch. There's a couple of alarm lights and an audible alarm that would alarm if there is any faults with the engine and let us know that we need to do a little bit more detailed troubleshooting. Below the main displays in the pilot house, we've got a couple of panels for mainly electric and electronic devices. This panel is for the air conditioning systems. We've got three heating and air conditioning units on the boat. These are all circuit breakers for those systems and a switch to run it either off of shore power or off of the generator. This is the panel for our Yanmar wing engine. Not much to say here, it's just a uh, you know, start stop and gauges. And down here, this is the panel for our generator. We've got an eight kilowatt Northern Lights generator that allows us to have AC power when we are away from the dock. Uh, a couple of other things down here, bilge, panel, bilge pump switch, this is a switch to switch between the primary and backup autopilot. So this panel right here is our primary electric panel and basically it's not all that interesting. There is a lot of circuit breakers here. This whole entire panel right here is our DC circuits. Uh, there's voltage uh, of each of our batteries. There's a house battery, an engine battery, and a generator and wing engine battery. And on the panel below here, this is 120 volts AC. Uh, this is all of our AC electric loads. And we can power the boat by either an eight kilowatt generator that we've got in the engine room or by uh, hooking it up to shore power when we happen to be in marinas. And the AC loads are divided into inverter loads and non-inverter loads. The inverter loads will run off of a 3000 watt inverter that we've got that uh, takes power from the main house battery bank. The non-inverter loads will only run when we're connected to shore power or to the generator because they just draw too much power. And the non-inverter loads, there's not a lot of them. There's the water heater, the washer and dryer, and the searchlight. These are controls for our wing engine. The wing engine is a 30 horsepower Yanmar motor that is kind of a backup engine. They call it a get home engine. It would allow us to uh, theoretically get home. It pushes the boat at about three and a half knot. These controls are, are pretty primitive. The engine's not on, so I can cycle these controls and show you how they work. Uh, the throttle control is basically just a cable and it's fairly stiff. You pull it out to go to make the engine increase in RPM and you push it in to throttle down. The transmission is this little thing right here. You push it in to go forward, you pull it out to go in reverse, and you kind of find the middle for neutral. There are detents, but it's not the most solid feeling thing. So luckily we don't use this very often. This panel right here is the controls for our reverse osmosis water maker. It's a pretty nice water maker in that it runs off of our DC system so we can run it anytime when we're underway. We don't need to run the generator to make water and it makes about six gallons an hour. Uh, below the water maker control is the control for the heating and air conditioning unit that is in the pilot house. And then below that you've got a rat's nest of chargers and AC stuff. Um, this is kind of a common sight on the boat with all the stuff that we have as far as chargers and other things that need to run off of AC. So our engine room is definitely not a walk around engine room, but it's more than adequate for accessing the engine on all sides. The engine, the main engine is a Lugger L668, which is a marinized John Deere engine. It's an inline six, 6.8 liters, and it puts out 105 horsepower. So it's, it's really derated for the size, and that's what allows these engines to get so many hours. So main engine in the center, um, we've got fuel tanks on each side. There are sight gauges right here that allow you to see instantly how much fuel is in each tank. 
Uh, I've got fishing rods stored inside here because there's really nowhere else inside the boat to store them. This is our exhaust that comes up off of the engine and it wraps back over and then it goes up the stack through the uh, galley and then up to the top of the boat. Over here is our wing engine. So this is our wing engine. It's a three-cylinder Yanmar engine that puts out 30 horsepower and instead of having a traditional shaft it has a V-drive so that's what allows this thing to be stuffed into the back of the engine room here. The shaft comes out um, through the boat right here and then up into this fixture right here. This is hiding the V-drive. And the wing engine also has its own independent fuel supply that goes through this big fuel transfer filter right here and then into an independent tank. And so if there was any contamination in the main tanks, the wing engine would theoretically have a clean fuel supply. We've got a Northern Lights 8 kilowatt generator and it uh, is kind of stuffed into the other corner of the engine room over here on the starboard side. And then I can actually walk around to the main engine. This is the hydraulic reservoir and the gyro compass and the control systems for our fin stabilizers and a filter for the hydraulic oil right here. Over on this side of the engine room, got some high current DC bus bars here. Our oil change pump is mounted below that. And then on the far corner over there, we've got two freshwater pumps, a uh, primary and a backup, so that if our freshwater pump ever failed, we'd be able to just instantly switch over to the backup pump. And up on top of the main engine here, this is the blower fan to exhaust the hot air from the engine room. And it's a squirrel cage fan with a duct right here that goes up the stack with the exhaust. And I've just recently replaced this with a higher volume fan and it's been working pretty well so far. A couple things up here we have an extra line. Whenever we're underway, we always tie up the anchor to make sure if you hit a big a big bump or some rough conditions that the anchor doesn't pop off. It shouldn't should be held by the anchor winch here, but uh, but we tie it on just for safety. These extra lines right here, it's called the bridle, so it's a lot of weight. This this unit is designed to pull the anchor up and down. It's not really designed to hold the load of the boat. We can actually hear it the nights that we don't put the bridle on. You can hear it making a lot of sound right down here in the master stateroom. So we put this bridle on, it ties on to the anchor, it distributes the load to two points. Um, we do that, it's a, a pretty simple operation. I'll show you, I use the control units here. These two pedals here will operate the anchor. It'll either pay out the anchor or it'll pull the anchor up. For safety, we always keep these closed. You don't wanna be standing up here and have your fingers or feet near this anchor chain and accidentally have it start moving on you. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put it in the up position. I'm going to pull it up so that I can grab the bridle off. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close up this lid. Last thing I want is for that anchor to start moving while I'm on the edge messing with it. So I wish there was a more graceful way to do this. Haven't figured it out yet. So what I'm going to do is just sort of wedge myself into the, the bowsprit here and unclip the bridle clip. The lever here, it's pretty easy. Just flip it back. Slide it up and off. The design here, it's a T-shape, so you can slide onto one chain, move it back, and then it slides forward before locking it. And then the reverse to take it off. Slide over to that groove and up. Where do we store all this stuff? Okay. So 
So I'm going to go into these lockers to grab the bag to store the bridal. We have these two lockers up on the foredeck. Here I have the bag for the bridal. That's where I'll stow the bridal once I put it away. And here we also have a jack line. When we're out at sea, we tie this up and we make sure all of us are clipped in with our life vests as we're wandering around the deck. We have a hose in here, a couple other items. Second locker houses our electric cords. We have backup electric cords and we have some backup lines in here. So I'll just pack up the bridle and stow it away so we can be on our way. Time to pull up the anchor. Dougal's usually operating from inside the pilot house and I'll be out here with this hose. This is a saltwater pump to pull up the anchor. Dougal's usually in the pilot house. There's controls for the windlass in there. He'll be pulling up the anchor and I will be manning the hose. Usually when the anchor comes up it's completely covered in mud, seaweed, things like that. And so we want to hose that off before it drops down into the anchor room. It can get pretty stinky in there if we don't do that. I also have a fresh water hose on the side of the pilot house, so I'll usually pull that up and I'll just hose off the windlass here to make sure it keeps in good working condition. This is a pretty simple but effective way to track how much anchor road we have out. We put these zip ties on and they're color coded. Portuguese Bridge, it's an area that's kind of a safe area where you can come outside the pilot house and walk around, get a better view than from behind the glass. And on nice days like today, it's a good place to just kind of hang out and get some fresh air. The Portuguese Bridge goes all the way around pilot house on both sides. Going this way, it uh, has steps that go up to our boat deck. So this is our boat deck. It's mainly got room for our tender, which is a 11 foot Boston Whaler with a 25 horsepower motor. There's not a lot of room up here when the tender's on deck, but when we launch it, it opens up a fair amount of space up here. It's just kind of another nice space to hang out outside. to subscribe to our channel. See you next time!